increasingly male suicide has not been seen as a mental health problem, not, not primarily a mental health problem, it's seen more as a societal structural problem uh, and men are dying by suicide in what is often seen as a, a rational solution based outcome to problems that they can't solve. There is very little empathy for men despite what a lot of people say. There's some horrible things said about them and it's like men men are just not deserving of compassion from society and then that's obviously where you become you encounter words like toxic masculinity male privilege male fragility mansplaining man well men live shorter lives in every single country in the world so lower life expectancy in every country and more likely to die at every single age group and then obviously more likely to be homeless more likely to die by suicide more likely to be addicted to drugs way more likely to be incarcerated far more likely to be killed by police more raising so obviously we highlight the male sex in the quadrant of um, privilege and perpetration. So we'll talk about male privilege and all the ways in which men are privileged, but never talk about the disadvantages, some of which we talked about and many of which we haven't on this podcast. The Manosphere is a group of different, like a, an umbrella of different groups of different types of men and boys who are doing different things to advocate for their needs. So don't be confused or feel betrayed or downtrodden by a very small minority of disproportionately loud assholes within both women and men who ruin it for everybody. Welcome back to the Everyday Perspective podcast. Please like the video and subscribe to the channel. Today we are discussing the uncomfortable truths of gender equality with George from The Tin Men. George, welcome to the Everyday Perspective podcast. How are you? Good, thank you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely fine, mate. Thank you for coming on. Um, so you're, a, uh, I guess, a content creator, a blogger. Your, your Instagram page um, sort of reads uh, widening perspectives around men, uncomfortable conversations and ugly truths, the unpopular other half of gender equality. So quite an interesting statement that, mate. Are you able to, I guess, give us in your own words what it is that you do and, and what content you create? Yeah, well, I mean, of course, there's two, there's two sides to gender equality. We've spent a long time quite rightfully talking about uh, the side that impacts women and girls. But that, that isn't to say there aren't things that impact men and boys and as someone from formerly from that space, I mean, I'm still considering myself an advocate for women and girls, but just no longer a feminist. As someone from that space, I felt like I could do better at having the conversation for men and boys in a way that was uh, empirical, evidence based, inclusive, but not but not apologetic, uh, and sort of outside of the very not quite narrow feminist viewpoint of men and boys issues. And I tried to expand the conversation. I like the word expanding because I don't want to take away from one side. I want to add to the conversation that's already happening rather than erasing it completely. And uh, yeah, I, I want to acknowledge it is an ugly conversation. Some of the things I post and share are uncomfortable. Does, that doesn't mean they're wrong. They're certainly not very popular to say some of the things I say, but I still think it's very useful to have that conversation. So it's the ugly side of gender equality, the side that talks about men and boys in a positive light. I think that's really interesting that you say expanding because a lot of people... Mm. A lot of the times, though, when you have a different viewpoint, they think that then you're going against what they believe. And it's not always the case, is it? No, well, I mean, no, I would say you can say you can say things about men and boys. That doesn't mean you don't feel strongly or you're not sympathetic to women and girls, too. Mm -hmm. I always get frustrated. Um, no, not, no point. I'm not pointing fault at you at all. But I always get frustrated when podcasts and interviews and stuff always have to go on these sort of. We always, always have to sort of pay penance to women and girls' issues and feminism. We yeah. always have to sort of apologize for what we're about to say. We always have to say stuff about men, but then it always comes about some sort of fine printed disclaimer as if, oh, we also care about women and girls. And that's not to say that women and girls don't experience this and X, Y, Z. And, and I always find, I, I understand why that happens and I used to do that and I'm doing it right now, but I don't necessarily think it's necessary. It, in the yeah, I couldn't same, agree more. I couldn't agree same vein, The same vein as when like people say, well, it's important to talk about uh, men and boys because that helps women and girls too. And I'm, I understand that. And that is also true. There is an in, indirect benefit to women and girls about talking about these issues. But I feel like we need to remind ourselves that the primary benefactor of this conversation are men and boys. And this is a conversation for men and boys in its own right. And there's nothing to apologize for. So I'm willing to say, of course, I care about women and girls. Uh, the, I'm very sympathetic to women and girls. Um, Pro-choice. I'm I've done a lot for women and girls who are um, abused and trafficked to my life. And I'm not going to say that again <laughs> for the rest of the podcast because I just don't want to undermine what I'm saying. I want to have a conversation just about men and boys. Not that I'm saying you shouldn't say that. I get it. I'm not, I'm not criticizing you. But it's you, still, you still go in, mate. 
<laughs> you can stop now. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, I'm, I'm a rambler. It's yeah, I, I understand why you you kind of preframe that, mate, because that's how it does feel to I think a lot of people at the moment. Mm. Um, but you know, we we've had a, a number of, of guests on so far talking about sort of men's health and men's mental health in particular, and you know, it's probably not talked about enough. It certainly isn't talked about enough. But but we we've highlighted the fact previously that you know the biggest killer in men under 45 you know in the uk but possibly globally i don't know i'm sure you can tell us is is obviously suicide hmm. so from your perspective from what you've been looking at and and the truths that you've been unraveling you know why do you think men are dying from suicide so often i mean every single suicide is unique to the individual and is it can never be summarized by one single claim like often we hear about male suicide as a result of toxic masculinity or the patriarchy which is just simply not good enough a very it's a very low resolution lazy answer in my opinion and and certainly does not line up with my own experience working and talking to suicidal men and especially talking to male suicide researchers i i have a friend who i'm always happy to shout out called susie bennett and she has done some of the largest, most seminal research on male suicide, perhaps ever, but certainly in the last five or 10 years. And if you ever ask her what causes male suicide, you, you will be on the receiving end of a very enlightening two hour long conversation about every single yeah. part. And even that she'll end with like, this is just one part of one field, which is just part of psychology. And then there's sociology and various different studies. And she is so uncertain and doubtful, in, even in herself that she can't just give one sing, sim, single answer to male suicide, that I feel like it's a very complicated, entangled conversation that requires very sensitive, delineated solutions. But overall, I mean, just to, get, to give you some sort of answer, I would say that increasingly male suicide has not been seen as a mental health problem, not, not primarily a mental health problem. It's seen more as a societal structural problem that is placing... Uh, a huge amount of pressure on men uh, and men are dying by suicide in what is often seen as a, uh, a rational solution-based outcome to problems that they can't solve. So if you talk to men who are suicidal, most of them don't conceptualize as having a mental health problem. They have a problem with their money or debt or their work. Or they might have lost their job. Perhaps they're experiencing some sort of relationship breakdown. Perhaps they're being abused. Perhaps they've gone through some sort of childhood trauma or sexual trauma. A lot of a lot of men who die by suicide are losing children. So in the UK, they say about twenty percent of male suicides are directly linked to child custody battles and relationship breakdown. So a lot of fathers who lose their child attempt or complete suicide. So it certainly is no one single thing, but it's largely. A combination and culmination of personal stress, stresses and structural causes that put men in a position where suicide is quite literally the only way out. And um, it's not just a mental health problem, although obviously mental health is a big factor too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and do you have any statistics? Um, sort of, we mentioned that obviously it's the biggest killer of men of the 45 mm. in the UK. Is that is that a similar view globally? Do you yeah, know? yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, men die by suicide more in every single country uh uk we're sort of more towards the higher end but no by no means the highest i think the worst are the eastern european countries especially bad the disparity of male to female suicide there is like huge some places like poland i think it's like approaching like eight nine ten to one so in, UK, it? it's no about, way. in the uk it's about three to one four to one and i think it's now the biggest cause of death for under 50s so it's getting worse and yeah, I'd say in, in most countries, most developed countries especially, it is probably the biggest cause <clears throat> of death for men in general. So a massive priority. And you've also got to consider like just suicide in general. You've got to look at it as as an action. You've got to assume that whatever, what what that man was living prior to suicide was actually worse than death, which is why he had died by suicide. So it's the iceberg really there's an iceberg even larger than the tip the tip is that huge that huge number which in and of itself is shocking but beneath that is a societal sense of misery and helplessness that are taking men towards suicide so yeah quite a difficult conversation quite depressing yeah it is yeah yeah it is it's, um i've had a yeah. few people close to me who's committed suicide and um you can kind of never really wrap your head around what they must have been feeling at that time I think that's my biggest thing with it. I always think how low they must have been to be mm. in that position and the lack of support maybe that they didn't have to be helped at that point. Yeah. So it's, so not only is it the, the, 
obviously I talked about personal stresses and structural challenges, but it's also the lack of help. So a lack of male friendly services and also and the APPG on men and boys wrote about this, a lack of um, empathy for men, a lack of societal empathy for men in general. And I mean, I think, I think most men, if you're honest and look at society, there is very little empathy for men, despite what a lot of people say. There's some horrible things said about them. And it's like men, men are just not deserving of compassion from society. And then that's obviously where you become, you encounter words like toxic masculinity, male privilege, male fragility, mansplaining, man, man spreading, man, ex, mansplaining. And like just these obscene shame, shame, shame terms, like obviously patriarchy and all this stuff is, uh, just bl blames men, shames men, and is not particularly empathetic. Yeah. And where do you think that comes from? Um, I don't, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't want to know. I mean, I, I think I have a lot of empathy for men, so I, I would only be able to talk hypothetically. But we have found ourselves in a political landscape that seems to be unable to comprehend of any sort of systemic disadvantage of men or dislike of men. And I just think in general, as a species, we have innately less sympathy for men and less care for men's safety and well-being. A lot of people put that down to sort of bio um, evolutionary causes and part of it is, but I just feel like culturally we don't care. We we've, there is now a monopoly of discourse around gender equality that has just erased men. And like patriarchy, for example, as a theory, which I don't support, it's quite literally name everything bad in the world after men, like everything bad in the world for everyone, for all of time is named after men so it's like really difficult to grow up in a world that sees men that way as inherently bad and as part of some sort of monolithic oppressor class and then they go look at boys and like what's how we talk about boys and how we see a lot of boys as just predators in waiting um <clears throat> the interesting thing i find is that the suicide rates between boys and girls are very similar but it's only when boys and girls reach adolescence that we reach that disparity where it's still tragic every suicide but it gets so much worse for boys when they hit puberty and i i often wonder at what point do we stop seeing a boy who's deserving of support and love and start seeing a man who's deserving of neither when does a boy become a man and when do we start hating them <laughs> and the interesting thing is that when men reach about 70 we have compassion for them again that when we old old men or women we have a similar amount of compassion for and similarly for children, similar amount of compassion. But it's when a boy becomes, looks like a man, essentially, that we seem to start hating them. But I, I struggle to understand why we have such little empathy for men, because I do have empathy. As much empathy as I do for women. It's fascinating, isn't it? it? It blows my mind when you say stuff like that, because it's so true, isn't it? There was a, there was a young boy recently in Plymouth that just committed suicide. In my son's school, a uh, year 11 boy. And wow. I just think about how he's how his parents are going through right now and what he must have been thinking. And that was only this week, this week. And uh, I won't say the school, but yeah, he's just committed suicide in Jack's school. And they, they didn't really, the, the school, the school didn't really say too much about what had happened. You know, obviously the rumors and bits and pieces, but yeah, he, he committed suicide and it's, and it's so sad. You know, he's fit like what you just said. When does he go from a boy to a man? You know, he's 15. He's in his last mm. year of school. Is it pressures of school? Is it, you know, all these different things, but again, is it the lack of compassion or is it, you know, no one really caring or thinking, oh, it's all right, you'll be okay. And then, yeah, it's too late. It's interesting what you said about like the parents were confused, didn't know what was going on. And that's so, so common for like the parents and partners and friends of those who died by suicide to have no idea what was going on, to not have, not have realized and not even know why they did it. Like even about, sometimes about no, people don't know why their partner died by suicide. And yet there's people on Instagram who seem to have the, all the answers. People on Twitter that have all the answers for male suicide and not only all the answers, but the same answer for every single one. And I'm like, there were so many partners who knew that man better than anyone and they don't know why they died, died, why they died by suicide. And yet some asshole on Twitter does. And I was yeah. like, we don't know and we may never know. And unless you're willing to start a conversation with that viewpoint, and that level of uncertainty, then you shouldn't be having that conversation. And it's very, very complicated. And I, I certainly don't want to give it any fixed answers because I don't know. I would never know why that boy tragically took his life unless maybe we were able to sit down with him or would have been able to sit down with him and talk to him perhaps and speak to his parents. And maybe then we might have a better understanding of just that one single suicide. So every single suicide is extraordinarily complicated and every single reason is different. Yeah, absolutely. And going back to the empathy thing, 
I, I wonder if there, some of that stems from, I guess, in history, men, you know, when they get to a certain age would have joined the military and, you know, been expendable as a result of that. And it's, you know, it's still something that's, that's not really kind of, you know, at the forefront of people's minds at the moment or talked about very much at all. And it's something that you've covered in, in some of your content, but obviously a, a huge amount of men throughout history have, have died as a result of war and military mm. and, you know, it's, it's all, all the same stories and it, you know, the ship goes down, it's the women and children first and then yeah. stay and it almost feels like it's just, you know, there's just always been this lack of empathy for men and an assumption that we'll, we'll take the hit when it comes to life. But part of that is men doing it to themselves. I mean, I hate to be the, I don't blame men, but I think men want to be saving women and children. They don't want to be on the life, life um, raft at the expense of women and children. And yeah, I feel like right. they sacrifice themselves because that's what they're told being a man is that's how they're valued and they don't see themselves as worthy of being saved i know so many men who feel this way don't see themselves as worthy not in such a dramatic sense of not getting onto life raft but that's i'd say that's one of the reasons why so few men do go to the doctors because they don't want to be a burden they don't think their health is that important they don't really care about themselves people are always ask like why do so few men talk about how they feel and i think one of the answers is just they know society doesn't care about them or they, at least they think society doesn't care about them. Uh, so yeah, I mean, sorry to interrupt you, but that, I feel like that's, I think that men put themselves in this position, not not through any blame, but just we're taught that we're not as important as women. I mean, in that instance, definitely get the children off the ship, for sure. I mean, I'd say children first, and then I'd say like disabled and elderly. And then if you're an able-bodied adult, then you're <laughs> sort of everyone to themselves, I suppose. But I mean, <laughs> let's hope I never have to make that decision. Mm, indeed. I think it's just a lack of, from from my point of view. I think it's you don't want to you don't want to seem weak as a man. You grow. I was growing up very old fashioned. You know, you be a man. You look after your family. You look after your child. You know, all those types of things. If I've ever gone for anything, I've just bottled it up, really, not talked about it, and just kind of pushed through. Mm-hmm. Luckily, I'm again. Well, I think I'm quite a strong person, but again, is it is it? Uh, am I a strong person, or is it that I just mask it to then? carry on do you know what i mean because i feel like around me they need me to be strong mm. yeah i mean I, I put a post the other day asking men what was your experience what was the reaction you got from female partners like wives or girlfriends when you did open up and like a lot of a lot i mean it's like half and half half of the stories were like she's amazing she's supportive she really helped our relationship blossomed we were so much stronger but there were so many men that were just like she used it against me she broke up with me she couldn't didn't find me attractive. She used it to justify cheating. She thought it was hilarious. A lot of them talking about like women who file away these sort of disclosures from men for, to be used uh, at a later date in an argument. One person described it like a squirrel getting nuts for winter. Do you know it's really weird you say that? One of our one of our guests actually said that his ex-wife done that, didn't she? Or well, no, his current wife. She was going to leave him before he went on TRT and she put, uh, put notes in her phone, if you remember, um, uh, every time that he was being a dick basically and she was going to use it as evidence to leave him it's really interesting you say that yeah and i feel like that's that's one of the reasons uh just going back to what you said earlier paul about like uh going to war i always you are right of course like the the, the death and pain of war on men paid overwhelmingly by men even in the last hundred years I never know why that's never brought up in the discussion of like generational trauma. Everyone talks about generational trauma as, as quite rightly, especially by like black communities from like slavery, but the war is even more recent and I would say just as barbaric. And no one talks about the trauma that men went to war, saw, saw things that are just not even imaginable so far beyond what I can imagine and terrifying. And then they have to come back and then just be a regular man. And they just could, there was no mental health support for that. That's obviously going to be passed down down to children, either biologically or just culturally for socialization, and passed down and down and down. And that's like obviously intergenerational trauma. And I've, I've never heard anyone talk about men's intergenerational trauma. And I was like, why not? Uh, such an interesting point of view that I wish more people would talk about. Yeah, it's a very good point, mate. And, you know, I've when I've had conversations previously, um, you know, I often – you know, have a, a debate with my other half regarding, you know, the vote and everything else. And I often, you know, reference, you know, that men were off to war and, and, you know, that was maybe one reason why they may have got the vote a little bit mm. earlier. 
you know, and, and, and our argument is often the fact that women had it pretty high during the war as well. And I'm a bit like, well, they did. Everyone had a pretty bad time in the war, but... <laughs> It's not quite the same, is it? It's not, it's not the trenches. <laughs> it's, not, it's not the same at all. It's like uh, Hillary Clinton said that twice now. Hillary Clinton's gone and said, uh, women are the primary victims of war because it's their husbands and fathers and brothers being killed. And I'm like, There's n- there was no doubt it's difficult for women, but... It's I'd definitely worse being, being killed. I'd rather... I'd rather not be blown up or killed or stabbed yeah. <laughs> or gassed. Like they, they, that's the real suffering. And I feel like that's a really, that brings back to why we have such a lot of empathy for men. Like a man, a man gets killed for his country and people like Hillary Clinton are more, are more sympathetic to his wife. And I was like, that is just, and she said it twice. She said it in the context of the Ukrainian war. And I'm like, you are so stupid for saying that. Um, and we just, and yet, well, and you are right about the vote. Like men, the reason why men got the vote, and most people don't know this, that half of men couldn't vote either until women got the vote. So all women and half of men got the vote in 1919, just over 100 years ago. And the reason why men did get the vote is because in recognition of the trenches. So all these working class men came back from the First World War without any vote. Uh, and then the government were like, the least we can do is give you the vote. Like You've, you've sacrificed everything for this country. We're going to give you the vote. And then they gave it to most women, and then they give it to all of women 10 years later. So I guess the nuance in that conversation is that, no, not all men could vote. Half of men couldn't. And about 100 years before that, no one could vote, apart from a tiny, tiny percentage of men. And then uh, there's only about 10 years where all men could vote and all women couldn't. So it's very difficult. And, uh, and obviously men, that, that vote came at the sacrifice of millions of men in the trenches. It's crazy, you know. I always find that stuff like that when people argue about something that happened a hundred years ago, I always find it hard to understand the relevance in their lives at times. Because a lot of people who say something like that come from a middle class life with no real issues with stuff like that, and then they'll they'll go and re- reference some shit a hundred years ago, and I'm like, it doesn't affect you. It doesn't yeah. affect you. Yeah, you know what I mean. That's what I don't understand more than anything. With a lot of this, a lot of the things that people talk about, it just doesn't affect them. So they've never experienced it. They're never going to experience it. Yet they can go and claim feminism, misogyny, this, that, the other. Again, with race and all sorts of different stuff. And I think a hundred years ago, that's never going to affect you. It didn't even affect your parents. No. <laughs> you know, so it's not in your household. You it's know, like, I don't yeah. understand it. Yeah, it's yeah. That happens not ju- happens in many different groups, like piggybacking off the pain of former generations, for which they never knew and never experienced. And the fact is, they were born in a time like me. They've only known a life of privilege. Like I, I same in same way that a lot of men do it. We talk about men going to war. So I've never been to a war. I'd shit myself if a war came to the UK. Yeah, and I'm I'm not going to always... piggyback off the pain and loss of my forefathers. And I don't think it's not fair for a lot of women to say, "Well, women were oppressed for thousands." Of-. I was like, "You were not around a thousand years ago." Now, you are not there. Neither was I. So I don't should be blamed, and you shouldn't get some sort of victimhood from it. Is that you were not there? And if anything, it's disrespectful, and it diminishes the pain that many women experience historically, but way before any of us are born. And like to use that as some sort of like lever to make some sort of political point of today, and to piggyback off their pain is not only wrong but just unethical and dishonest. I think, at least. Yeah, I think sometimes that comes from people's lack of understanding about, I guess, where mm. we are in reality and in, in, in present day. And I think often it, it comes from a place of emotion and feeling and they latch on to that, that one thing they're aware of, which again, as you say, isn't really relevant. Yeah, and it's used to justify the continued disadvantage of boys of today. So as we know, historically, women were largely excluded from education, although some women were educated. Most women weren't. And women were certainly systemically disadvantaged in education. In America, they changed it in 1973. They wrote Title IX, which would bring women into education and say you can't discriminate on basis of sex. And starting in 1973, finishing 1981, gender parity was achieved. So 1981 in America, equal number of women and men were going to universities. But then we just continued. We didn't sort of stop swinging the pendulum. We kept on going. And now women, men, sorry, men are further behind now than women were 50 years ago. So... And if you say that, people are like, well, women were disadvantaged historically. And I'm like, fine, but boys and men are disadvantaged now. And like, we need to stop, just take, stop looking backwards and start looking at today and into the future because boys are being disadvantaged now as women were more so, if anything. The same with health, like in America, it's a lot easier to get stats from America than the UK. So I'm going to reference them more so. But in America, of the top 10 causes of death, nine of them are dominated by men. 
and men die at like 1.6 times the rate as women, especially during COVID. Like being men are, men's health outcomes are worse across every single socioeconomic, ethnic and racial group in America. And like the number one cause, number one demographic factor of early death is being male. Like it's, it's so bad. If you say that to anyone, someone's like, well, women's health was ignored 50 years ago, hundred years ago. And I'm like, yeah, but this is not a history lesson. This is uh, today. This is right now, 2023. And like, it's impossible to ignore boys disadvantaged in education, men disadvantaged in health and that uh, stop looking back and like need to ch- make, make change now. Like, this is not a pendulum swinging contest. And like, we need to like, actually remind ourselves of today and what's happening today. Yeah, indeed. We, we've had um, we've had a number of guests come on, and we, we've had a number of conversations regarding obviously men and mental health and everything else. We've we've had uh, someone from Andy's Man Club who, who mm. was obviously a talking a talking group for men. So one of the local facilitators came on, and you know they talked a lot about you know men need to talk more. Yeah, um, we've had a couple of other guests come on, and you know sort of attributed maybe some of the, the the rates of depression and suicide to men not having purpose and struggling with relationships, both yeah. romantic and otherwise. Yeah. So, fr- from your perspective, mate, do you do you see that there's a responsibility on men to 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 kind of, I guess, do better and and get through this period where we are in time, or do you think it's more on society to change now at this point? Uh, I mean, society I means this is a societal problem, and men as part of society need to help solve it. But the solution is not limited to just men. I'd say anyone that cares about men, which I hope is everybody, should be part of the solution and should be doing their bit to take a little bit of the pressure off men and do a little bit more to listen. Like I'm all for talking and I'm very much supportive of Andy Man's Club and other places that provide encouragement to speak. But speaking is only, is limited to how much people are listening. And I'm not sure people are listening. Like, like I said, like men's health, boys' education, no one's listening to that. And if you do talk, try and talk about it, it's only ever used, ever addressed in a way of bringing up women and girls. Uh, and like we talk, especially even more, more controversial topics such as like domestic violence which is a huge cause of male suicide when you consider 11 percent of men being abused will attempt suicide and there are millions of men who are being abused in the uk people are not listening to them people are not having that conversation so it's all very well and good people saying then men can talk but if society is not going to a listen and b act on what they're saying or what they're hearing from men then i'm like that talking really only benefits the man in terms of making himself feel heard. But the problems he's talking about are not going to get solved. Like talking is an excellent means of dealing with the problem, but the problem can only be solved by societal change and us as, as a society acting on what we're hearing. So again, I'm all for men talking. I don't want that to be lost, but that is certainly not a complete solution to male suicide, in my opinion. And uh, we shouldn't pretend that it is. I, uh, yeah, I completely understand what you're saying. And I think the, the problem you've got more so than anything is, is the men that do speak out get silenced. Yeah. So even us having this conversation now, you know, you, you, you never know that you could get cancelled off of Instagram, YouTube, whatever sort of thing, just for having a general conversation like this with no hate, with no problems, you can, you know, they can decide that they can, they can shut you down. And, um, my, my point to that is someone like yourself that's, you know, kind of banging the drum for this. Have you had any pushback with, you know, all those types of stuff? You know, have you had any, you know, any accounts blocked or deleted or any sort of problems like that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. I mean, one of the interesting studies of like aggression finds that women and men are equally aggressive if you, if you factor in things like relational aggression. And often women... Sh- show their aggression in different ways to men and unfortunately choose their nature what i talk about there are a lot of women uh, a huge amount of women that support me but also a small minority of women that certainly don't and a lot of them are behind the scenes reporting my content you know these little whispering campaigns and that's like all oh, fair enough good luck to you and that does obviously have an impact on my account it does get me shadow banned it does limit my reach sometimes it sometimes posts get deleted sometimes slides are removed the other week i was banned from doing instagram lives for three days for no reason whatsoever and it's annoying because that the following day was like International Men's Day. And I wanted to have a, a, a chat with my friend, Blake, who set up a hiking group for men. And we couldn't talk about it because I was banned. And I was just like, I keep, I keep getting told that I've had my say. And now time to get to the back of the queue. And I'm like, I can't even have a say now. <laughs> like I'm constantly being told to shut up quite literally or having content removed or deleted or like, yeah. 
I find that crazy because it's not hate speech. That's the, that's the difference, isn't it? They, they, they'll go, oh, it's hate speech or it's this or it's, you know, misogynistic. But it's not misogynistic. It's just no. banging, banging your drum. But every other, what I find from my point of view is every other race and ethnicity and, you know, gender can say exactly what they feel. But as a white male, I feel like oh. we are completely nullified in every sense yeah. of the way. Yeah, and Especially even us, my, my initial, yeah, but my initial thing, even when I, when we started this podcast for men's mental health and trying to help men, you know, one of our big reservations, well, my big reservation was just, you know, people having that opinion of you that you're some misogynistic prick and it's nothing to do with that, you know, and it's, it's trying to get your, your message out there in a way that helps other men to stop people again committing suicide to feeling low and maybe maybe trying to make a change in society but it's so hard yeah it is and um just, just on that i came across uh, a gamma bias recently hmm. which uh, which i was both shocked and quite angry at but can, can you explain just just for for danny in the audience what what that is and, and offer some examples of where we've seen that yeah uh, gamma bias is a a new concept uh, cognitive distortion cognitive distortion that simultaneously highlights and erases the male sex depending on what we're talking about so gamma bias is split to four, four quadrants depending on what we're highlighting or erasing so obviously we highlight the male sex in the quadrant of um privilege and perpetration so we'll talk about male privilege and all the ways in which men are privileged but never talk about the disadvantages some of which we talked about and many of which we haven't on this podcast and i'm happy to go on to talk about more uh, and then we also talk about male perpetration so similarly like male violence uh, and then we have like people talking about gunman and knife man and henchman and con man like man 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 and then whilst we highlight perpetration and privilege, we simultaneously erase celebration. So we rarely celebrate men for being men or we, celebrate, we rarely celebrate masculinity. We are, that often goes into perpetration of toxic masculinity and so on and so forth. And we also um, we erase men in victimhood. So we don't really talk about men who are victims of things, like in terms of, unless we're talking about victims of themselves, of course. Um, but we don't talk about male victims of sexual abuse, boys who are abused, men who are domestically abused by especially female partners. There's a thing, there's this thing called the hidden, hidden victim, where because we don't talk about female perpetration, and we also don't talk about male victimhood, a man who is a victim of a woman is known as a hidden, hidden victim. So he's, he's, he's erased doubly over. So... Gamma bias talks about how the media, uh, society, and the psychological industry talk about men in a way that highlights the bad and erases the good. So we talk, we highlight perpetration, and privilege, and we erase victimhood and celebration. And like it's interesting, you'll see like um, you see it in London all the time. Like I, there was a, a sad story, a tra tragic story of that young girl that was stabbed in London recently. And I got a few messages being like, I can't believe you're not talking about it. That just shows how biased you are. Da, 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 da. And I was like, do you know there were 14 boys stabbed to death this year consecutively in London alone? And no one talked about any of them. And then one girl gets stabbed and the whole world, understandably and quite rightly, is up in arms in protest. But no one protests for the 14 boys. No one. No one even knew who they were. So that's gamma bias. We, we're erasing uh, the male victims and we'll highlight the male perpetrator. Uh, as we should. Does we that should, come from the media? That. Oh, is that, is that uh, directly every, from the media? Yeah, I mean, anyone that's watching this podcast, I, I recommend you go home <laughs> and like, turn on the TV and the news and just see how we report about it. Like we gender the bad, and then and similarly, you'll see stuff in like we're erasing, for example, Palestinian men. For example, is happening right now. We're talking about women and girls of Palestine. Help, please help donate to save women and girls. Or you know, a thousand people killed in Palestine, uh, including. 100 women and girls and we, we highlight the women and girls but we just don't even talk about the men and boys who are being blown up in at least equal numbers and killed in equally tragic circumstances even right now we're negotiating the uh, release of the women and children hostages but not the men and i'm like that's the same and it creates it leads to a very warped perspective of men and boys that seems to think that they're privileged in every single possible way and they don't experience any sort of hardship they can walk the streets without fear as you constantly hear you know male privilege is being able to walk the streets without fear and i'm like <laughs> I, I live in london and i'm like quite tall quite big i'm always scared when i'm walking around at night because i know as a man i'm at even greater risk to, than women to violent crime and uh <clears throat> that's gamma bias and it's leading to a distortion of how we see men that sees it as overly negative and it's it's 
you see it on the news, you see it on the TV, you see it in on social media. And I suggest anyone just go and have a look at how often we see the male gender uh, prefix to bad things. And then erase completely. You see it like knife man stabs to death, uh, 10 victims. Or you'll talk about like when a man intervenes, because a man is obviously more likely to be violent, uh, but he's also more likely to intervene and stop the violent man. But when we talk about male bystanders who are more likely to intervene, we talk about, again, we erase gender. We talk about like vigilantes or passers-by or good Samaritan. And we erase the gender completely, even though they're almost always men who are intervening to save the lives of strangers. So that's kind of bias. And John Barry, Martin Seeger developed it from the BPS. And I recommend anyone Googling it if they want to read more. It's very, very interesting. Yeah, you do, you do really see it a lot. And I think going back to the stabbing example, I think it was perhaps last year, I think London saw the highest rate of teenage stabbings. Um, mm-hmm. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that was the statistic. Mm. But again, that was what was reported. It was teenage stabbings. Yeah. But I think it was exclusively male teenagers being stabbed. Yep. Yeah. But imagine if that was all girls. Yeah, Imagine if that was well, all girls, it would be it would be an it would be a, an epidemic, wouldn't it? It would be an absolute problem. And it's an epidemic. <laughs> it, it yeah, is an yeah, epidemic. But, uh, yeah, yeah, it is an epidemic. But they don't they don't look at it as an epidemic, no. do they? I think that was twenty twenty one, and the fact that the the stat you're talking about is twenty twenty one was the deadliest year in Lon- in London's history for teenage stabbings. So more teenagers stabbed to death ever in London in twenty twenty one, and if you look at if you go and Google it again you'll see the headline saying 20 teenagers killed, 25 teenagers killed, 30 teenagers killed in epidemic. And then you'd have to like really dig to find out every single one of those teenagers, not 90% or 95%, but 100% were boys, uh, almost entirely young um, working class inner city black boys. And then not, not, that was never mentioned. And then, and then the next year, same thing happened again. A woman is tragically killed. And then Sadiq Khan, who's the mayor of London, is banging the drum about this epidemic of violence against women and girls. And I'm like, you presided over the deadliest year in, in history of London, and with which all the, all the victims were boys. And you said nothing, Sadiq. And now one girl is killed. And now you're talking about this violence against women and girls epidemic, which is an epidemic, but it so is the violence against men and boys. And it's like, that is gamma bias. And just cowardly on his behalf. Like, I really hate Sadiq Khan. Like, I used, I voted for him. I'm a Labour supporter. But he is an idiot, in my opinion. He is just virtue signaling, ineffective idiot. And that's just one example. I can give you plenty more. <laughs> you know, it, it's so true that people really are unaware of, 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 you know, some of what men are going through. Are you able to share some of those statistics, both around, I guess, deaths, education, crime, everything else? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess the headlines are like, I mean, I'm... Um, it's always, it always feels a bit disingenuous just listing, r- rattling off like some sort of generation game. But it's basically in top line, it's like, well, men live shorter lives in every single country in the world. So lower life expectancy in every country and more likely to die at every single age group. The age group I'm in, I'm about, I think I'm about two or three times more likely to die than a, a woman of my age. Uh, if I was in America, that is. So more likely to die in every age group, lives, lives less, less life in every single country, uh, and obviously education, we can talk about that, like boys behind every single age group in every single area in more or less every single Western country in the world. So that's, again, quite ubiquitous. Um, and then obviously more likely to be homeless, more likely to die by suicide, more likely to be addicted to drugs, way more likely to be incarcerated, far more likely to be killed by police. Uh, and then we talk, it's very, again, specific to America, but a huge problem of circumcision around the world which is like demutilating the, boy, the, children, um, the genitals of boys. That's horrific. Um, domestic violence. Men are about between 30 and 50% of domestic violence victims, and there's very little support, refuge, or any sort of empathy or conversation for them. Uh, and then, like I said, of health, like nine of the top 10 causes of death are dominated by men. At work, only two of the 13 or 14 job categories expected to grow the most are dominated by men. And it's all just like, pretty bad like one of the things is that workplace death again especially in america the amount of men that die at work is terrifying like thousands of deaths every year more men die at work in america every year than all of the military deaths in the entire iraq war from the american point of view and that's just i mean like I, and then that just like even fucking mental doesn't it yeah and it's like it's and it's not mental. and people chalk up men and boys issues to like individual failings or internalized problems like the boys who are falling behind at school are not trying hard enough or the men who are dying early from 
uh, health problems? Or should we go into doctors more? Or men who die by suicide? Just, why can't the men just talk more? And it's like we just sort of throw the problems at the feet of men and that we, take, we accept no responsibility as a society to help fix them. We just ask, like, I, it's put quite well when someone's saying, you know, like, when a woman has a problem, we ask ourselves, how can we fix society? When a man has a problem, we ask, how does that man fix himself? And I'm like, that is not good enough. And the fact is they can't fix a lot of these problems. A lot of them, for example, like we talk about, I mean, obviously you talk about fathers' rights and how fathers literally don't have equal rights to mothers. They do not get equal um, child custody. They do not get equal parental leave. Uh, and they quite literally do not have equal rights in like, the most literal way possible. Um, and the same, we, we see a, a very large systemic discrimination against men in many different areas of the judicial system, especially criminal court, not just family court, but criminal court where a man and a woman go into court for the same crime with a similar, similar cr criminal record, the man is going to get a longer sentence and is more likely to go to jail. A woman is more likely to avoid prison and will get a lesser sentence if she does get uh, incarcerated. And doubly so if you're black. And um, there's, low, there's so many different examples but uh, that's just a few. And too often, men and boys' issues is like men not crying, men not talking, uh, men not wearing dresses. And I'm like, those, sure, add those three in too, but there's a lot more to it than those three things. Yeah, I, I, d I definitely encourage our audience to, to go and check out your, your Instagram page and the infographics and the, the information you put out. Because Please, and the captions yes, and the sources. Mm -hmm. Check the sources. Yeah, uh, don't it's it's, it's unbelievable. It. It's unbelievable when it? when. Uh, I only recently come across your page because of because uh, of Paul and when I started looking at your content, I was like, I was just mind blown because I knew it was a problem, but I didn't realize the depth of, of the problem because it's on no, it's on no main media outlets, is it about these problems, you know? And it and you know, as as blokes, we know they're there, we know those problems are there, but we you probably just don't realize how how much of a big problem it is. Yeah, and I'm, I'm glad you mentioned about the sources there as well because that that's the first thing that I hear a lot is where I'll mention some of these stats and people are like, bollocks, he's made it up. Where's he getting this information from? <laughs> so, so the fact you reference and cite where that comes from, I think, is yeah. so key to, to putting that information. Uh, yeah, out. I mean, a lot of a lot of the work's done for me. Like the, the key, I often talk about the keys on my keyboard. I use most when creating content is just copy paste. I'm just finding the research, copying it, pasting it, copying it, pasting it, and I, all I need to do is put the information in front of people. I don't need to make it up. It's all there. Like the the, inf the studies into especially in domestic violence are so huge and so compelling. That I really just need to show you what's, I just need to hold up a mirror, really. And a lot of people don't like what's looking back, but that isn't my fault. Um, and I'm more than happy to provide sources. I mean, happy that's the best part. That's the best part of what I do. I have all the sources and I have all these great ideas that no one's talking about. And uh, yeah, I invite those people to come to my page. Yeah, absolutely. And and just to, to be a little bit balanced and play devil's advocate, I, I, I imagine some people might watch this. And I, I say people because it, it may be women opposed to men, but. I mean, you know, is, is there is there a, a kind of research bias to, to what it is that you do? I mean, everyone has a, everyone has a bias, for sure. Like, uh, I, I, <clears throat> every human being has uh, is prejudiced in some sort of way. And that's why I try to present new, numerous sources. Like, I'm currently engaging in a conversation on Twitter right now, and unsuccessfully. Someone's saying, <laughs> someone asked me to provide five different studies that show gender parity in domestic violence so say, just to show that men and women are equally violent and he was like give me five sources and i was like i can give you 200 sources right now i gave him a meta-analysis of 200 plus studies taken across 30 years conducted by probably the leading researcher of domestic violence in the world the, the man who founded the field of family violence so i'm like 30 years 200 studies by one of the best researchers in the world here you go and he just spat it out he said, like, I don't want that. He was like, who is this man? And I was like, he's not just a man, it's Murray Strauss, like he, Jesus. And then I gave him another, it's like, I gave him another 200 studies from, from uh, Martin Fieber. And then another 700 sources and someone else. And it's like, I can keep going. Like, I don't just give you one study. I try to give a meta-analysis. So meta-analysis be, being like a, a analysis of, of, of like generations of research. And I still get accused of cherry picking. And I'm like, there's a lot of bloody cherries on that tree. Like, Hundreds, like quite literally, I, cut, I just counted them all up. It was 1,300 studies uh, and sources, surveys and articles I gave to him. And he still didn't listen. So I'm like, oh, I'm not sure what more I could do. So see you later, mate. Yeah, that's it. That's insane. Let's that, that's get into that, that a little bit because that is something that I, you know, we wanted to talk to you about because certainly for us, when we, when we first saw that, that information, it was, yeah, it was, it was quite surprising. And 
and certainly initially quite unbelievable. Mm. And and again, the, the conversations I've had with females primarily, but even some men, um, you know, I was having a, a pretty good debate with a, with an ex police officer recently about this exact thing, and he just would not accept that you know there was any sort of equality around the the amount of violence in a relationship, and he was very much leaning towards that it's always men. And the argument that I often get from people as well is although you know, men might get abused, you know, that's a gentle slap or a little dig in the arm, whereas male violence to female is often, you know, quite, well, it can be fatal in, in more cases, arguably. And, and obviously the, 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 the damage done is far greater. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and again, then I play the balance view and I'm like, well, you know, are you judging what's right and wrong based on the level of impact? And some people go as far as saying, well, yeah, men should know better than to hit women hard if they get hit by a woman. What yeah, do you say so, to that? Well, I'd say just don't, first of all, don't hit anyone, most importantly, including women. Uh, and I'd say absolutely correct that uh, men's violence towards women is often more severe, but not not hugely. It's not a massive disparity. Like, Although women and men are equally violent on a case-by-case basis, women are more likely to be a victim of severe physical violence, but not by a huge amount. And women are more likely to be killed by a partner but and that is about three to one. So about seven, I think it's like seventy-seven percent of domestic homicides are against women. But that's not to say one in four is not. And that's not an insignificant number. That that twenty-three percent is still worth talking about. And we also got to consider that that's just domestic homicide. There are a huge, a huge amount of people who, as we talked about suicide, who end their lives as a result of being abused. And they are overwhelmingly men. Plus, you have corollary victims who are sort of people that are not within the abusive abusive relationship that were killed as a result. So children, for example, kill, children who are killed by uh, within domestically violent relationships. That is mostly boys and men. And then you also have um, men, people that are killed by law enforcement. So someone's being abused, they call the police, the police turn up and they kill someone. That is almost always men too. And if you take that as a whole, if you just look at deaths related domestic violence, including homicides, but also the ones I mentioned, then it's very similar. In fact, often it's more men die as a result of domestic violence than women if you look at it in a more ne- in a more sort of nuanced sort of way as a more complete picture but you're they're very right in the sense that uh they they are telling the truth when they say that women are more likely to be severely abused and more likely to be killed that isn't the complete truth that is not the complete truth the complete truth is way more complicated and it takes a long conversation and it's a bit more boring not as exciting and also like it's just a mischaracterization of domestic violence in general when people start reaching for domestic homicide which isn't which is obviously a huge problem that is still a very small percentage of domestic violence that's a very very extreme form the, the vast majority of domestic violence is nothing like that and is a bit more mundane a bit more mild just from my point of view what what exactly is domestic violence like what do you constitute as domestic violence is there any sort of how, is it is it verbal? Is it physical? Is it everything? Because wow, I mean that's a really great question. It really well, is there on... a difference between a, abuse and violence? I guess that's right? what I mean. Yeah. Like you know, there's there's a definite grey area, isn't there? Because like you said, women, um, you know, they they use their anger in a very different way. Men use their mm. fists a lot of the time, whereas mm. women are a lot more spiteful and a lot a, a lot cl- a lot more clever with it. You know, yeah. and uh, brutal just in just in like their nature. Women yeah, know that better know, than so... anyone. Women know better than anyone how cruel some other women can be. Like brutal. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, I've, definitely. I've I've, been, I've had a life. I've been bullied by women and men, and I'm like I'm not sure which one I like more. But like in school, especially the boys would just come and punch you in the back of the head, which is you know not great. But then the girls would just start gossiping about you or just basically destroy your entire <laughs> reputation. So I'm like, I don't know which one I prefer. I feel like people understand that men have more power in the physical realm because just because we're physically stronger than women. But women are more emotionally eloquent than men. And it would make sense that they would use that that skill and advantage to hurt men. Uh, obviously, the vast majority of women would never do that. The vast majority of women are excellent, as are the vast majority of men. But the bad women are obviously going to use that to their advantage, and they do. Like these whispering campaigns, this cancel culture, like destroying women's credibility, just attacking someone's relationship. And I'm like, women get a front row seat to that. Like far more than I can talk about. And uh, yeah, like it, what is what is domestic abuse? Domestic abuse is a lot of different things, including domestic violence. Although I would I would say domestic violence would require some sort of physical assault. But that's not to say other parts of domestic violence can't be as bad, if not worse. Uh, 
<clears throat> one of the things that's talked about a lot is about parental alienation, which is basically where a, one of the parents turns a child against the other parent. And that's done by both women and men, perhaps more so by women, or that's difficult to tell. And people are struggling to define that as domestic abuse when it absolutely is. And a lot of our domestic violence charities like Refuge UK and Women's Aid are trying their very best to say that is not abuse because they, they, they very well know that a lot of women are doing it and they don't that want break that to my be heart seen more than anything. With my son. Like, you should it, that would, honestly, that stories. would break my heart more than anything. If, if my son detested me because of, of, you know, my wife, if we split up and she'd done that to me, that would hurt me more than anything, I think. Yeah. But I'd like to say that my wife is pretty, a, a pretty great woman. And, uh, yeah, she, I don't think she'd ever women. do that. And the vast majority of women are just like your wife. But yeah, and she is, and she is. She's a she's a good <laughs> mum, and and she's not, you know, she's not manipulative, and she's not like that at all. But I think, yeah, I think that would hurt me the most if if my son hated me. You know, that would just life. That's in the called heart. soft power. So soft power is the ability that you can sort of uh, persuade people or influence people uh, or change people's mind or manipulate people. I suppose that's soft power, and women are just have more of it than men. Uh, good and bad and men have more hard power which is what we talk about in terms of political power especially when men are, are literally in positions of power that's hard power and physical power but the power we don't talk about both power dynamics and I would, yeah, as you said Danny like I'm not I would I'm not I haven't got a child but I would probably feel the same where losing a child to parental alienation would be more painful than any you know punch or kick or slap like to have 100%. the child turned against you like what is there anything worse than that no no not for me especially where I I've always actively tried to be a very good role model and a good dad. You know, it, he comes first above pretty much everything. Well, he does become first above everything in my life. So for him then at 13, 14 or whatever to turn yeah. and, and hate me, that would just, yeah, I, that, would, somewhat, that would really hurt. Like a person you love could destroy your life without lifting a finger or touching you. And that goes Yeah, 100%. Ways. 100%. That would destroy me. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I've, I've got a, uh, I've got a four-year-old son and, um, I, I, I spoke about this before. Prior to having a child, I, you know, I didn't care much for children. I, I haven't got young siblings. I don't have young nieces or nephews, um, and I found myself, you know, as a, as a parent, and I, I'd never felt so vulnerable as, as a man in my entire life mm. as when I had a child. Um, mm. And I completely echo what Danny was saying that for me, um, and you already touched on that at the start, and you said about twenty percent of of suicides can be attributed to, to lack of access to children. Mm. Um, can completely believe that. And I, I'm surprised it's not higher, but I, I, I don't know how, how easy you can measure that statistic. Well, that's it, isn't it? You can't measure it. It's probably a, a combination of things that end mm. up causing someone to commit suicide. But I, I definitely think that would be a huge factor in it. Yeah. On the uh, on the role of, of fathers, mate, um, I saw, again, some, some of your information recently about, um, you know, sort of fatherless homes and and especially boys and, and men again who, who grew up without fathers and and some of the disadvantages that gives them can we can we go into that a little bit because again a conversation i've had with my other half and, and other people and I, I i feel like that's probably no reflection necessarily of the of the, of the female and the mother it's it's maybe the lack of a role model or a male role model mm. um i mean what's your view of that oh i mean the stats are sort of undeniable in the sense that everything I've talked about in terms of health outcomes and being bullied and uh, those uh, um, who abuse drugs and die by suicide and have become homeless and drop out of school, that is all positively correlated to fatherlessness. So a child, a boy, especially coming from a fatherless home is more likely to fall into all, all of those problems. Um, and no one seems to talk about it. No one talks about how we do need fathers at home and how that problem is compounded by so few positive male role models in general for men in the, in the media, but also at school. Like you've got to think about like in America, one in four boys have no father at home. And then 80% of classrooms at school have women in it. So a tiny majority of classrooms have men, male teachers, a, a, a a large and growing group of boys have no father at home. So you're going from home with no dad, you're going to school with no men, you turn on the TV, there's nothing really there for you. It's all toxic, this and patriarchy, that, and like very poor, poor role models for men. Like, that's like, you know, the father figures like Homer Simpsons and the Howe and the Peter Griffin, like inept clownish dads, really, really bad. And now I'm like, well, who are they going to go and speak to? Who are they going to follow? People like Andrew Tate and uh, Fresh and Fit and whoever else. 
and I'm, I don't support any of those bloggers, uh, but I totally understand why they get such a huge following because the men and boys that follow them have been betrayed by everybody else. And uh, yeah, father, I would say fathers are just as important as mothers. Um, and we need to remind ourselves of that and lift up fathers, not like call to cancel Father's Day or whinge or whine about this sort of stuff. And I'm like, there's so much evidence for it. And really, really interesting studies into like how important male role models are, to bo- especially to boys, but I'd say to girls too. Yeah, and it's um, and you you, t- you touched on earlier as well about obviously sort of family law um, mm. and obviously the equality there or lack of um, yeah the, the, the inequality sorry there. Mm. Um, yeah, it seems mad, doesn't it, that you know sort of men get such a hard time in there's there's so many men and and, and again we've already talked about this again, but. Where men want to be involved in their, in, their, in their children's lives, but you know, maybe for one reason or another, they're maybe not a good partner, but they're a good dad, but they're just completely shut out. And it seems often they're in a position where they they literally can do nothing. I mean, you know, we is that is that likely to change? Do you think, or is that just how it is for the foreseeable? Um, it's very difficult to solve the fatherlessness the fatherlessness crisis. Because we really need more good dads, not just more men who are fathers in homes. We need more supportive male role models. And ultimately, as I mentioned, I'm pro-choice. And when I say pro-choice, I'm also pro-choice for men. And you, you sort of stumbled into a very controversial conversation, what's called a paper abortion, which is now known as a voluntary parental sur- surrender, which is basically about affording men the same elements of choice as women get in terms of a woman's choice to become a mother uh, extends past conception right until she has a baby and even then she can give up the baby but a, man, a man's choice of becoming a father does not go past conception like he does not get to opt out of being a father he has the choice of having sex or not and that is really it and a, a paper abortion is basically a man's hypothetical right to opt out of all responsibilities and privileges of a child as long as he as long as he lets the mother to be no early in the pregnancy so she can make an informed choice about keeping or not keeping the baby. And I'm like, that's an interesting conversation where we should think about allowing men to be fathers as or if they want to, or when they want to, in the same way that we've done to women. Like I truly believe um good parents are ones that choose to be parents, not ones that are like legally compelled to do it or forced into it because of some sort of accident or some sort of irresponsible sex. And people I will probably be saying right now, well, if a man didn't want to be a, child, a, a parent, then he shouldn't have had sex. But then I would say, well, let me remind you of consenting to sex is not consenting to parenthood. And that is a feminist slogan that you'll see on placards waved around outside um, in sort of uh, pro-choice rallies. And I'm like, we, we should consider giving men more choice on when or if they become a dad if we are also expecting them to be good dads simultaneously we also need to give them equal parental leave like it's not good enough saying men get two weeks uh child child leave when they have a baby a woman should have a year like how could a man ever have equal responsibility if he's not even going to get equal rights and when i say equal rights i do actually mean rights because men fathers do not have equal rights and yet we demand them to have equal responsibility and i'm like no like the the other half responsibility are rights rights and responsibility go together so you cannot ask men to have equal responsibility for children without also giving them equal rights to those children so that's what I'd say. More choice, more rights, more freedom, and more like just championing of men in general, especially in the media, and more men in classrooms as well. Yeah, no, it's an. In- I've, I've come across that that argument, and um, maybe not one for today, but yeah, it's an interesting. Yeah, I've, um, I've, I've never heard of that. Have you not? No, I've never, I've never heard of that. It'd, it'd be definitely a, a hard one to to get over the line, something like that. But a lot of a lot of feminists support paper abortions, like people like Karen DeCrow, very much supportive of of uh paper abortions giving men that choice and they were like why should a man be forced to finance a woman's autonomous decision like an oh, uh, autonomous woman making an autonomous decision for herself should not expect a man to finance that choice like it really oh, i completely it agree with stuff like that i'm on about with yeah yeah i do i do it, 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 it seems stuff. fair it does but yeah. it, it does but then also the the flip argument of that is then it's another child with without a father potentially that's but what's better it? though to have, is it better to have a present but resentful dad who didn't want to be dad and resents his child as a consequence or is it better to have no no dad at all and obviously neither of those I, I, again I think it's, 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 i don't know you know we don't know do we 
No, and I guess allowing a man to leave would give space for another man who does want to be a step parent to step in and be like, I, will be, I want to be dad, I will be a dad. And I think there's plenty of those men around too. But um, it's, it's difficult. I didn't necessarily, I'm not 100% support of it, but I want to have that conversation. Yeah, it's a good conversation, conversation to have though. It's definitely yeah. interesting. It's definitely interesting, isn't it? Because again, we probably all know men that have been, I would say, trapped yeah, female I know, because I know they've, so many. because they've had a baby, you know, and and yeah. there's no two ways about it. There's there's probably you know, loads of <laughs> so many men out there that you know were maybe not even in a relationship with a girl. They've they've mm. got pregnant and then they've ended up you know having a relationship, mm. being a, a dad, but not really wanting to. But because they know that they're not they're not a shitty person, so they're like I'm going to go along with it. How many blokes yeah. are like that? You know, most yeah, most men are not bad people. Most men, men are pretty good people, like everyone. Most most women are, but again, in those situations, they they go along with it, they carry it on because it's the right thing to do, and they probably live those lives for years and years and years. I've got loads of friends that are in that position that I like, and I know there's people offline and online who probably were not that interested in having children, but had them anyway, even against their will, because they wanted to keep, you know, it's because they were they were didn't have a choice really, <laughs> and, yeah. and yeah. I'm like. If they had the choice, then perhaps the women making the other side of that choice would be a little bit more mindful of the consequences of their decisions. If they couldn't legally compel someone to be the father of their child. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it happens quite often. Like um, I was just watching a peep show just, just this morning, the episode where Mark has sex with um, Sophie with a condom, it splits. And then she like intentionally rocks back and forth in that position. So she <laughs> gets pregnant and then it ruins his life. <laughs> <laughs> he ruins his life because he never wanted to be a dad and he's a shit dad which is not surprising because he never wanted to be one I guess it's the size. financial side of it though isn't it as well for a woman if you're I think of like if a, if a if a woman's not really got a job they've got no aspiration to work and then they they can have a baby you know society allows them to to have a have a house have a place to live mm. have you know all those all those advantages of having a child that they wouldn't have and I've seen it happen. Obviously, I used to work in town in in the Plymouth City Centre, and you'd get a lot of like young mums with with children with no with, with no dads, mm. and they would be so fucking open about it. They'd just be like, "Yeah, I'll have a couple more kids because they get more benefits." So, like, what do, what do you think about things like that? Does do you, do you think that happens more than it doesn't? Or I mean, I, I would say that's well outside my area of knowledge. I wouldn't want to comment. <laughs> I would say that I mean, if you go back like fifty years or so to 1960s in America where abortion was illegal uh, and of course in many states it is now illegal again unfortunately um, there were a lot of women in 1960s and earlier in America who, were, who couldn't afford to have a, a child or a family but because there was no option for an abortion they were forced into having children and they not only resented that child a lot of the time but they could, literally could not afford it either in time energy or money but they had to be a parent because they had no other choice. And that child would more likely grow up into a life of criminality or delinquency. Um, and he, he talked about it as part of the Donahue Levitt hypothesis that theorized this, uh, the drop in crime across America in the early 90s was as a result of women winning the right to choose if and when they become a parent a uh, generation earlier. So women that were able to make an educated choice on if they became a parent or not were... Um, uh, like having that choice and then having choosing to become parents as a consequence. And I'm like, it just comes down to choice, but the best parents are ones that choose to become one. And that's obviously true for women. And we've all benefited as a society of women having that choice. And now it's time for us to benefit again, perhaps by giving that same choice to fathers or fathers to be. Yeah. Interesting. And, and going back to the role model thing, we, we've talked a bit about, you know, sort of good fathers and lack of role models and therefore, you know, sort of arguably good or bad role models online and everything else. I mean, in, in mm. your opinion, you know, what, because I, I know when I was growing up, I, I had a, a, a father and there was also, all, you know, there were films with Arnie and everybody else. So there was, you know, a role model at home. And then you also had these strong role models on the film as well, whereas it seems to be obviously a lack of both these days. What, what do you think a good, a good role model is as a father? Do you have an opinion on that? difficult because you want to you want to acknowledge how fathers and mothers do in general bring different skills to the table but at the same time you don't want to limit what a father can do or what a mother can do like there's no reason why a mother cannot be a, like a, a male role model and vice versa 
but at the same time fathers and mothers are in general different i feel like traditionally fathers will bring a more physical style of play to children which is very very important in terms of developing stuff like consent like understanding what physical touch comes from um rough housing it's called which is where like a, a parent typically the dad wrestles with a child and from that they understand the importance of physical contact boundaries and like a lot a lot of boys grow up um only understanding two types of physical touch one being fighting and the other one being sex and obviously rough housing is neither of those and i feel like rough housing which is often done by fathers has a massive positive benefit to boys and yet rough housing is increasingly being condemned as boys being boys and i'm like it's not it's not and it's a really important part of uh, child's development um that shouldn't be disregarded and I, I would like fathers and mothers but but especially fathers to to encourage a sense of adventure a sense of risk taking uh and, it, and in some instances challenging authority in children um independent thought and then it's like oh, well why can't a mother do that and they can um it's just very difficult to answer that question about falling into some sort of gender stereotype but i do also acknowledge that fathers and mothers aren't quite the same so i'm sure i'm struggling to give you an answer that can i give you an answer to your question without making a rod from my back um <laughs> yeah well, that's that's the problem isn't it it's that you you say the wrong thing and uh then well, that's the mid- i'm trying to walk down the middle and I, as it, margaret yeah. thatcher, it's hard to do margaret it, though, thatcher said it? it and i I hate Margaret Thatcher, but I do like the quote. And she said, if you walk down the middle of the road, you get hit by both sides. And it's like, I'm trying to, <laughs> I'm trying to walk that tightrope without getting slammed by a car. But yeah, men and women are different in general. Not all, not all of them, but in general. But that's not to say women cannot be like men and men cannot be like women. Uh, so I wouldn't, want to, I wouldn't want to pigeonhole father too much. But just their presence is important, I think. Yeah, I guess I'm. I'm just trying to understand. I, I, I guess the, you know, the the stats around boys and then men who, you know, as a result of having no father, are, you know, mm. high risk of, of drug addiction, prison, mm. crime, um, everything else. And I guess I'm trying to understand is is that because of the lack of discipline in the house or the lack of you know example of what or how they should behave yeah but again, I, mean, I guess it's, it's hard to like know. role modeling yeah or well, i guess it's an ex- it's a it's a lack of like modeling male behavior in general that like part of that might be discipline part of it will be other things there's a there's a really interesting story a true story that i read about involving elephants in kruger national park where there was a lot of poachers in kruger which is a, a big park in south africa and um, they basically wanted to save the elephants. So they took the elephants and put them into like a second, into a sanctuary and then bred the elephants. And then when the elephants were back to a big population, they were going to take them back to Kruger. So when that happened and they were basically trying to take these elephants back to Kruger, but the helicopter that was lifting them couldn't lift the male bull elephants. So that the father figures of the herd and the families. So they were like, no problem. We'll just take the mothers who are smaller and the children that are smaller and we'll just leave the bulls behind and they'll find new mates out in Kruger problem solved and then about six months later they found huge things like rhinos and other big game uh dead just scored to death for no reason and it's like there aren't many things that can kill a rhino so the park rangers were shocked and they were like what the hell is going on so they basically watched and they found these big marauding bands of young juvenile male elephants and they were like i wonder if those are the elephants who have been deprived of the, the big male bull elephants because we left them behind and they were so they, and they were they were like well let's go get a bigger helicopter bring the fathers back in and they did and it solved the problem like the, because the, those young juvenile ma- male elephants that were killing rhinos had not been in the presence of the large bull elephants who would help who would have helped them understand what it's like to be a juvenile adolescent male elephant going through what's called musk which is very similar to what boys go through at t- in a teenage age where you know they're more violent more aggressive impatient and that's why you need a father figure or in the elephant case, a bull elephant to help you help socialize that and, and model your behavior off of them. So luckily the park rangers brought back the elephants, solved the fatherlessness crisis in an elephant sort of way. And it was a lovely ending. And I was like, what a great way of understanding the importance of maleness in families and society. True story as well. I think, I think, I think you're, <laughs> you're right in what you're saying. Uh, but definitely in my house, it's like my wife is a lot, a lot softer than me just in general in a by nature you know and if jack is you know do, 
just being a knob. I'll, I'll tell him he's being a knob, you know, and I'll say <laughs> to him, stop being a knob. Like, whereas she would look at a more diplomatic route and yeah. just say, stop being a knob, you know, and I think that's so important. And just through my experience of, of just, you know, some of Jack's friends who haven't got fathers on the scene, you know, mm. they're running riot. <laughs> that's the only thing yeah. I would say. They're running yeah, yeah. riot compared to my boy. And, and I'm not saying he's perfect because he's not, but he's definitely got that thing where he knows if he oversteps a mark, he's going to get some repercussion at home, you know, never, never physical, you know, but it's always mm. just, uh, just to, you know, I don't even have to say anything. Sometimes it's just a stern luck or something like that, you know, just to say you, 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 you're doing something wrong here. You yeah, know, yeah, but I think, right I think way. it's a dynamic though, isn't it? Because I, I, I know plenty of families who have the opposite dynamic where the, the mm. mother is a disciplinarian and, and the father's yeah. the loving parent. I think yeah. it might've been Jordan Peterson who talked about that. You, you can't be both of those things very effectively. Hmm. So you almost need, you know, sort of that dynamic where one is a bit more of a disciplinarian and one is more of the sort of carer and the, and the lover, perhaps. I don't know. It's all fascinating, isn't it? It, it changes between each person, doesn't it? It changes between each couple, each person. Yeah, dynamic, that's that's the know? important thing. Like it's it's in all about individual context. Of my family's the same. My mum was the, I mean, definitely a lot harsher, more disciplinarian than my dad. My dad is a, a lot kinder. My mum was kind too, but she was the one that everyone was more afraid of. Let's put it that way. She ruled the roost. She was in control of the house. She was the matriarch of the family. So I'm, I'm obviously an exception to the rule, but in general, fathers are shown to have greater discipline. And um, in the way you described Danny, to tell kids not to be a knob. And that's <laughs> I mean, that, that's, true, more, that's a generalized just... difference in men where they're more assertive, perhaps more willing to set boundaries and more importantly, will enforce his boundaries more often. That's what Warren Farrell talks about in the boy crisis. And he, yeah, he basically says like, yeah, men, fathers more often set boundaries and more often enforce boundaries are more authoritative and more likely to discipline children. Yeah, indeed. Um, we, we've t- we've touched on obviously masculinity a little bit throughout this conversation and, and everything else. And I'm, I'm curious to, to understand in a second what your thoughts around the definition of that is because there's lots of different views on that these days. Um, and one other thing I wanted to touch on, which might link in as well, and I'm, I'm probably going to pronounce this word wrong, but this kind of just highlights the fact, but misandry is, is a <laughs> word that I come across recently. Did I pronounce that correctly? Yeah. 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 Good enough. Yeah. I mean, I, I never heard of it. Yeah. Danny, before. Danny hadn't heard of it until this week. I had come across it fairly recently. What, what is that word and, and why isn't it talked about very much? Well, misandry is the, uh, the other side of the coin to misogyny. So misogyny is obviously a dislike and hate of women. Misandry is the dislike and hate of men. Uh, and it does exist, although people don't know it as a word. When I write it down in my content, which is all the time, as you'd expect, it's always seen as a spelling mistake. I'm doing my little spell check at the end and it's like, this is a spelling mistake. I'm like, no, it's not. <laughs> no, it's not. It's a real bloody word. And yeah, it, just, it basically summarizes it basically d- describes behavior that sees men as in a negative light or hateful way or fearful of men. It's just think misogyny, but against men, basically. That's what misandry is. Yeah. Okay. And, and, is, it, and is, it, is it, you know, is it sort of a, um, you know, is it a sort of biological sex thing or is it, is it like a trait thing? So is it, is it a sort of hatred towards masculinity or, or, or men? What's the, what's the, is that, what's the definition? Men or men. Uh, the actual definition is about men, but I would say that, I feel like we have an additional sense of hostility towards traditionally masculine men. Like often when we talk about role models, I know that when I ever say we don't have many role models for masculine men, I get a lot of pushback from certain people that don't like me who are like, well, yes, we do. Here's X, Y, and Z. And they often list off quite more feminine men. And I'm like, I think we should talk about there aren't many positive masculine role models who are men. And Arnie's a good one. I, I, I had this conversation with uh, Chris Williamson on his podcast, and we actually just could not think of any good positive male role, male role models who are masculine. But I, since then, I've texted him, and I'm like, the answer is Arnold Schwarzenegger. And I said that having watched the Netflix documentary about him. And I was like, what a great guy. Like, he was certainly not perfect, talking especially of his affair. But even the way he talked about his affair, he just took full accountability. And he's just, that man has conquered so many different areas of the world, like film, entertainment, bodybuilding, and then politics. And he's done it with such grace. And he's such, so hardworking, so impressive, went through a lot, came from nothing, took full accountability for his stuff like his affair. In, in, in a TV show, he was just like, I got no excuses. What I did is wrong. And that's really the end of it. I'm ashamed of myself. And I was just like, wow, brilliant. That's the best you can do. So 
there are a few male, masculine male role models and decreasingly so, but I like to think Arnold Schwarzenegger is one of them and you should go watch the documentary. Yeah, I mean, I grew up watching Arnold Schwarzenegger, so uh, yeah, I'm a right. massive yeah. fan. We're of that age. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I, I totally mischaracterized him. I thought he was just the typical meathead, you out of brain, but he is really smart, and I feel really bad. So sorry, Arnold, for thinking <laughs> so low of you, and I'm embarrassed to say that I thought that, but I realized I did hear that. Um, I think when he was doing Mr. Olympia back in the day, he he, he did so well, obviously because of his aesthetic, but mm. but also he was very charming and and very good at sort of very charismatic, mm. very outgoing. Mm. Yeah. You're- all you need to do is watch Pump and Iron. Have you ever watched Pump and Iron? I haven't watched it, no. If you, if, if you ever want to know what Arnie was really like, watch Pumping Iron. Like it's, it's him in his heyday and he was he's just a fucking legend. You know, he's just, he, he was charismatic and exactly the same as he is now, but he was like 30, you know? He's so cool. Another one, sorry, another one, Keanu Reeves. That guy is amazing. Like he is just, oh, if you read about him, he's just amazing. So that's that's a really interesting um, comparison there now because, as you say, Arnie on the outside is very clearly what many would consider a masculine man. He's ginormous. Um, Keanu Reeves is far more subtle of a masculine man, I'd say. Um, and I wanted to, to, you know, sort of ask about, I guess, masculinity and what you see it as because, you know, depending on who you are, some would say that masculinity is is being aggressive, violent, and dangerous. Others would say that it's, you know, being strong and stoic. You know, some people these days would say it's being in touch with your emotions. I mean, what, what do you see masculinity as? Oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I do think there is such a thing as masculinity. And I do feel like it's in part biological uh, and also culturally enforced. But it's so difficult to describe. I mean, I would say some of the words you said are are typically masculine. <laughs> like accountability, strength, stoicism. I mean, a lot of people say leadership, but it's like, I don't think that's fair to say that's a masculine trait anymore. Uh, but ultimately, I always get a little bit philosophical when people ask me this question in the sense that, although I do believe there is such a thing as masculinity, I believe it is part of a very ancient part of our brains, like the, the earliest part of our brains that are simply don't have access to words. So there's a part of our brain, the name of which I've forgotten, that is so old it deals in just emotions. It doesn't actually have access to language. So if you look at, you know, when you look at something and you have a gut feeling it's wrong or right, but you can't describe why that's that part of your brain being like, don't do it, don't do it. And I'm like, I wonder if masculinity and femininity exist in that same part of the brain where it certainly exists and we all know what it is, but it, it doesn't fit into such a modern concept of language. And I, I always, that's my answer. That's kind of cowardly. So that's the best I got. <laughs> but I, did, I think, I, I feel like masculinity is in everything. It's like the way people walk or act or look or sing or like there's just certain things to it. It's very difficult to, to pin down. So I would, again, I would want to give it's, myself. It's a definitely word, a feeling, like, isn't it? Masculine yeah. person. You know, it's like the way someone walks might be masculine. And like, I feel like it's just, you just know what it is. It's hard to explain what, is what makes that walk masculine but i'd say it is masculine there's certain activities and things people do that are masculine i don't know why i can't i can't attach words to it but i i think such a thing does exist and i don't think it's entirely socialized yeah yeah okay i was curious to see what you thought on it um so obviously there's masculine and feminine traits and you know the, the sort of the, the word feminist gets banded around a fair bit these days as well and and I'll be completely honest, it's not something that I fully understand. You know, I, uh, yeah, I mean, what, what do you see sort of modern feminism as? Is, is, you know, is that where this sort of hatred towards men comes from? Or is it, is it pro woman? Is it anti man? How do you define that in 2023? I mean, just in the same way that there are many different types of men and women, there's many different types of feminist. Uh, feminism is a very broad church. Like there's sort of um, Marxist feminism and conservative feminism and trans excluding feminism and liberal feminism. And there's obviously four different waves and different groups in those waves. So there is, there is also no single word answer. And I mean, I'm, I'm a nightmare for podcasts because I'm not, I can't really provide you with solid sound bites. But feminism in general claims to be about total equality of men and women. Um, but but often some parts of radical feminism, which is another part of feminism, which is almost entirely 
unhelpful in my opinion um i think it's all about it's more often about lifting women up above men and denying what men and boys go through um and it is not about quality or it's it's about quality but just for women and uh not for men but it's difficult everyone has their own definition and it annoys me whenever i point out problematic feminists a lot of people will say well that's not a true feminist that's not what feminism is about and i'm like well they are a feminist and that's what they call themselves i mean my in general i don't have an issue with anyone that's an, that's a feminist individually like i mean i'm also i'm very supportive of women having connections of other women and having very important discussions about their experiences and trauma and bonding and communities in feminist spaces. That's great. I'm all supportive of that. The, the problem I often find is organized feminist groups such as Refuge UK or the National Organization for Women or Women's Aid who are organized feminist bodies who are out there uh, campaigning against men and boys, lobbying government to exclude them in, ver in various different gendered laws and stuff like that. And like, we talked about fatherlessness and how mothers and fathers don't e don't have equal rights to their children in America. A lot of that is down to the National Organization for Women, which is the largest uh, feminist group in the country, in America, perhaps even the world. And they have been massive pain in the ass for lawmakers who have been trying to give equal custody to mothers and fathers. And there's about three states now in America that have equal actual equal rights for fathers and mothers, and the rest of them don't. And Florida was the last state to try and go gender gender equality and it was a national organization for women that were rallying against it and picketed rick scott i think it was to stop doing it and he didn't he didn't go through with it so although i'm very supportive of women who want to talk to other women and bond and understand as feminists i'm fully supportive of that and i have no right to take that away from anyone i do not i often do not support some of the organized feminist groups that have gone against the beliefs of a lot of feminists in fact and are actually acting in their own self-interest under the guise of feminism so what's the difficult um, conversation what's, what's the what's the male word for feminism so like <laughs> what would you be like what's that is that is that even a word well a male, oh, male. There's, there's certainly plenty of male feminists and i know that better than anyone. no no i mean I no know. i mean as in what's what's the male word for for what oh, you are i don't know honestly i in you know general, i mean there's there's, the there's feminism what's the male version of it well I mean, people talk about men's rights activism or men's rights advocate an mra which is often seen as a pejorative slur um, <clears throat> when it shouldn't shouldn't be. But men who talk about men's rights are men's rights activists, MRAs. But then there's other groups. So you have that the whole manosphere, which is often a misle misunderstood concept. It's like a basic. The manosphere is a group of different, like a, an umbrella of different groups of different types of men and boys who are doing different things to advocate for their needs. So men's rights activists, for example, I've mentioned, they're all about trying to change a the system. They want to change laws. They want to change committees. They want to actually help men and boys. Then you have like the red pills, the pickup artists, uh, like Andrew Tate. So they're trying to exploit the system. They like, well, let's keep the system as it is. And we're going to exploit it to have sex with women and all drive Bugatti Bayrons. And then you have, um, <clears throat> You have the MGTOWs, M-G-T-O-W, which stands for men going their own way or incels as well. And they want to leave the system. They don't want to change the system. They don't want to fix the system or exploit the system. They just want to leave. So they men going their own way. That's just men who are just op op opting out. They're like, I don't, want to, I don't want to get married. I don't want to have a life with women. I don't want to have children. I just want to live my own life. And that's it. That's roughly how the manosphere works. Although it's even more complicated than that. So the manosphere is, I guess, to answer your question, that's what is the opposite side of feminism. Or you might have menemism, or you might have men's rights activism. But in general, I don't, I don't badge myself of any of these things because I don't want to be part of a tribe. I want to just be myself, and I want to be accountable for my own ideas, not someone else's, uh, if possible. So I'd rather have my own set of political opinions, which I can pick and choose and change or remove or add, as and when I choose, not when my wider group does. So I'm not an MRA, nor am I a feminist, not a MGTOW, any of that. And 
I, I it makes me cringe a little bit. All these labels, like the manosphere, it makes me just a bit like, oh, all right. I don't know why you've got why people have to label everything as well. Yeah, it's like what you just said there. You can have your own opinions, and and opinions can change. That's the other thing as well. You can you can change your opinion. You know, if someone says to me, you know, I'm I I do stand fairly neutral on on some things because I'm I'm not that bothered either way. <laughs> so I find like it, I won't have a strong opinion on certain things. I do have a lot of strong opinions, but on certain things that that I don't really care about, I don't have a strong opinion on. But if you if you give me a credible argument about something and and it and I believe that that's the right thing. And then I will change my opinion and I will happily apologize for my old opinion, you know? But I think if you do become one of these, uh, like, you know, like a feminist who's in a group and they all believe a certain direction, if you then think outside of that, then you're kind of like, the backlash can be a bit, bit extreme, can it? Yeah, I mean, if you're a feminist, I guess what I would say makes a feminist, what unites all these different branches of feminism is a belief in the patriarchy. I feel like that is the USP of feminism because the vast majority of people in the uk and, and most parts of the world do believe in total equality of the sexes it's something like more than 80 percent in the uk but only like 20 percent of people in the uk are feminists so the majority of people who believe in total equality of the sexes are not feminists so that's we got to ask what is the usp of feminism and i'm like patriarchy theory and that's when i'm like i'm out I'm all for the total equality of sexes. I'm all for empowering women and girls. But when we start these concepts like patriarchy and all the bullshit that comes out of it, I'm like, count me out. I'll just stick with the women's rights and leave the rest behind. And I encourage people to have a, to at least consider that too. But yeah, you're, you're, I'd say you're one of a small and diminishing minority of people, Danny, who are able to change their mind. And I often find that because fe to be a feminist, you're sort of constrained by this theory of patriarchy. I often find you arrive into conversations with like a bit of a it's like a brick in your mind a set of ideas that cannot be changed the patriarchy has to exist at all costs and a bit like a religious person has to has to protect the world like the world is ten thousand years old so any religious person has to hold on to that if you're a christian a feminist has to say patriarchy exists and if they see something that proves otherwise like the vast majority of homeless people are being men they i don't think they can have that conversation in good faith and it always ends up in some sort of weird, backwards, somersault, gymnastics bullshit. Where they're like, well, when I say like, well, how come men and boys are behind at every stage of education if we live in a patriarchy? And they're like, well, that's just the patriarchy backfiring. And I'm like, that is so gutless. <laughs> I'm like, that doesn't, make any, that doesn't make any sense. What? Men and boys disadvantaged patriarchy, men and boys advantaged patriarchy. Well, I'm like, that doesn't really leave much <laughs> in between, does it? So I'll pass on that. And I would say... Yeah, I mean, don't be afraid to change your mind. And you can only really change your mind if you're not really part of one of these political groups. And um, yeah, be an individual. And, I've, and I don't give a fuck what people think. <laughs> Amen. On on that note of, of, of changing minds there, and, and I'm similar to Danny, I'm you know pretty flexible in regards to my view on things and i try and be as objective as i can and you know look at what what the data and you know the evidence says on you know on both sides and form an opinion based on that and mm. i try my best and it's not always possible because i'm human of course but to, to remove emotion from from my views where i can mm. and i saw i think recently you did a uh a, a bit around what is woke and it was great because prior to seeing that, I really couldn't define it. And I think it was something along those lines from what I, I remember. It was, you know, the, the, the people forming opinions and views based on how it feels and how they feel versus mm. what is actually reality. Could you very quickly just summarize those those couple of slides that you did in, in regard to what woke is? Well, I mean, what is woke is, again, that's very subjective. But what I've seen from the current concept of being woke is someone that picks their political opinions not based on evidence or, or on what is actually true or has some sort of productive value in the world but they pick their political opinions on what looks good so they'll wear their politics like fashion accessories and they'll virtue signal and they'll grandstand and they're really you know in the simplest terms they're more interested in looking good than they are in doing good so I like to think some of the things I talk about on my page about how domestic violence isn't a gendered issue and there are lots of violent women. That does not look good to say that. That makes me look like a misogynist, even though I'm not. But it is true and it is doing good saying that. It is doing good. It just does not look good. So I'd say being woke is about valuing looking good above doing good in your political opinions and choosing your political opinions 
on what is most socially beneficial or culturally fashionable at any particular time, often at the detriment to evidence. And I'm like, I, I will believe what can be evidenced, even if that is horrifically unpopular. And often what a lot of the things that are unpopular are true. And a lot of things that are popular are wrong or not the complete truth. So that is where I'd, I'd put the woke and it is increasingly used as a pejorative. Although I, I did used to consider myself as woke, but I mean, who knows what it is really. No, it's a good definition. Um, and then just finally, man, I think we've covered this throughout the conversation, but in, in the way of a summary, um, if, if, you had a, if you had a magic wand um, and you could change whatever you wanted, you know, what would you change? What do you think needs to happen for things to improve? I just feel like we need to, in, as much as possible, separate our, our emotional knee-jerk response to a lot of the things I talk about, things like domestic violence, I keep coming back to you, but that is obviously a very, very emotional issue that far too many people have first-hand experience of. And I totally understand why people would react in a sort of backlash kind of way when I talk about men who are victims of violence, because a lot of men are perpetrators of violence. And I would just encourage people when they hear things they don't like, not to immediately just throw it away or spit it out, but just to sit in the discomfort uh, and actually consider it, as difficult as it is, to sit in the discomfort and recognize, like I said, just because something is unpopular doesn't make it wrong and and base your opinion on the facts on the objective facts of the matter not on what is most socially beneficial to you and and in general just to have a little bit more compassion and understanding for men and understand that the men we hear about in the news who are doing horrific things who do exist that is a small minority of men and the women i talk about in terms of like parental alienation and domestic they are a small minority of women like i want to say the vast majority of women are wonderful people as are the vast majority of men and don't be confused or feel betrayed or downtrodden by a very small minority of disproportionately loud assholes within both women and men who ruin it for everybody like, like the, these assholes are so loud and annoying they take up so much space that we seem to think that all people in that group are like that or all men are this way and they're not so I would say, yeah, see people as individuals first, not as members of groups. And that applies to women and men and feminists and MRAs. And uh, I'm sure there's a few, there's more than one thing I'd like to change, but I guess there's, there's a lot of things that do need to be changed. So that's your answer. I'm, stick, I'm sticking to it. Brilliant, mate. Well, that's been great. It's, it's been a, yeah, a really interesting conversation and I hope everybody listening will go and check your content out. We'll put your um, your links, your description in the description below. Thank um, you. And at the very least, just, yeah, let's just start a conversation about it, I guess. Mm. Yeah, start talking about it, start listening. And uh, yeah, you can follow me at The Tin Men on Instagram. Legends. Thank you very much, Thanks, mate. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Cheers, mate. Thank you. Thank you.